This video was brought to you by Brilliant. On Sunday evening, ethnic Serbs in Kosovo protested against a new law banning Serbian license plates by blocking border crossings into Serbia in North Kosovo. In response, Kosovan police set up blockades nearby, and there were even reports of shots being fired by Kosovan authorities. So in this video, we're going to explain the current unrest, what it means for Serbia and Kosovo, and whether it could spill out into a wider conflict. If you like our videos, then be sure to subscribe to help us get ever closer to 500,000. Anyway, before we get into the most recent events, a bit of context. Now, relations between Serbia and Kosovo have been tense since Kosovo declared independence in 2008. And, well, Serbia still doesn't even recognise Kosovo as an independent country. And this history goes back a lot further, too. Both countries used to be part of Yugoslavia until the 90s, when an economic downturn and the rise of Serbian nationalist Slobodan Milosevic triggered Yugoslavia's breakup. And things actually first came to a head when the Kosovo War broke out in the late 1990s. This war was between the Federal Yugoslavia Forces and the Kosovo Liberation Army, a Kosovar Albanian rebel group. And NATO even ended up getting involved, intervening decisively against Milosevic's forces, despite never actually receiving authorization from the UN. During the conflict, NATO forces killed about a thousand members of the Yugoslavia security forces and about 500 civilians. That was until June of 1999, when, after a 78-day bombing campaign, Milosevic agreed to withdraw all federal troops from Kosovo, and NATO sent a peacekeeping force into the region. Now, the Kosovo force, commonly known as KFOR, originally consisted of nearly 50,000 men and women from 39 different NATO and non-NATO nations, but it has since been scaled down to about 3,600 troops, mostly from NATO countries. Anyway, the war ended with Kosovo being placed under UN supervision, and in February 2008, Kosovo declared independence officially, with 109 of the 120 members of the Assembly of Kosovo voting to secede from Serbia. Now, while the declaration was deemed illegal under the Serbian constitution, it was approved by the International Court of Justice, and the Republic of Kosovo was subsequently recognised by a majority of European Union countries and the United States. Now, unsurprisingly, this didn't go down well with Serbia, who still don't recognise Kosovo's independence, or the ethnic Serbs living in Kosovo, most of whom live in northern Kosovo, near the Serbian border. Now, these ethnic Serbs who live in Kosovo have regularly protested efforts by Kosovan authorities to assert their jurisdiction in the region. And in 2011, when the Kosovo police sought to take full control of the area, one Kosovan police officer was even killed, and 25 more were injured. Anyway, let's come back to today and the recent unrest, which was triggered by plans from the Kosovan government to ban Serbian car license plates, which are commonly used by ethnic Serbs in northern Kosovo. According to the BBC, some 50,000 people living in the region use license plates issued by Serbian authorities, in part because they refuse to recognise Kosovan institutions. So, when Kosovan authorities first tried to ban Serbian license plates in September of last year, ethnic Serbs in the region blockaded roads on the Serbia-Kosovo border, and even set fire to Kosovan government offices. In response, the Kosovan authorities subsequently scrapped the policy, but they didn't give up forever, attempting to reintroduce it on Sunday triggering another round of protests and leading to hundreds of ethnic Serbs blockading two border crossings with trucks, tankers and other vehicles, prompting Kosovan police to restrict movement on the border. And there were even reports of shots being fired at Kosovan police, but according to official reports, no one has been injured by them. 
In response to the unrest, NATO released a statement declaring that they were prepared to, quote, intervene if necessary. But on Monday, Kosovan authorities agreed to delay the implementation of the new rules for another 30 days. This move was welcomed by the EU's representative for foreign affairs and security policy, and the Serbian president, with both of them saying that they expected tensions to de-escalate following the postponement. But the issue won't go away forever. So what happens next? Well, Serbia-Kosovo relations are particularly tense at the moment, even putting aside this border dispute. And that's largely thanks to the war in Ukraine. Belgrade, Serbia's capital, has been conspicuously sympathetic to Putin's invasion, and this has prompted some anxiety in Kosovo. And Kosovans are anxious, both because growing Russian influence in Serbia could destabilise the historically volatile region, and because Russia's invasion might encourage similar sentiments within Serbia. Now, this might sound dramatic, but there have been some ominous signs already. In March, for example, just a few days after the invasion, thousands of Serbs marched in Belgrade with placards reading, Crimea is Russia, Kosovo is Serbia. And on Sunday, a Serbian MP and member of the ruling SNS party tweeted that Serbia will be forced to begin the denazification of the Balkans, an ominous reference to what Russia describes as its denazification campaign in Ukraine. However, despite some bellicose language from Serbian nationalists, further conflict looks unlikely, if not impossible. Now, this time round, the border tensions calmed down after the Kosovan authorities agreed to delay the new license plate law. But ultimately, neither Serbia nor Kosovo has any real appetite for conflict. As we mentioned earlier, NATO still has a significant presence in Kosovo, which makes military action very, very unlikely. Nonetheless, while military escalation might be unlikely, the recent tensions are still bad news. Before the war in Ukraine, Serbia-Kosovo relations were steadily improving, largely thanks to the EU, who have spent over a decade facilitating dialogue between the two sides. In fact, there's even an EU-sponsored project to try and achieve this, which was first launched all the way back in 2011, and aims to, quote, normalise relations between the two countries, a prerequisite for their accession into the EU. Now, while Kosovo is only recognised as a potential candidate for accession, Serbia applied to join the bloc in 2009. And if it can normalise relations with Kosovo, it's expected that these negotiations could conclude by 2025, giving Belgrade a real reason to make friends with Kosovo. Anyway, this dialogue certainly was making good progress. While it did originally focus on exclusively technical issues, it's since evolved into high-level talks involving top political leaders from both sides. And in 2013, the two governments even signed the so-called Brussels Agreement, a treaty which outlined a timetable for normalisation of relations. Then, in 2020, the two sides went one step further and signed the so-called Washington Agreement, a pair of documents that essentially aim to improve economic relations between the two sides, something that was facilitated by the Trump administration. However, this progress has since been reversed, in part due to tensions relating to Serbia's stance on Russia and Ukraine. Now, the Brussels Agreement was already on the ropes before Putin invaded, but things have got significantly worse, leading the Serbian president on March 24th to claim that, quote, it no longer exists, citing a disagreement with the Kosovo Judicial Council as the primary reason for these negotiations falling apart. This recent unrest on the border will only strain relations further, which is why it's so imperative that it's resolved quickly. The point we're making is that Serbia-Kosovo relations were actually on the up until recently, and that a lot of political capital has been spent on improving relations, which is why this deterioration is such bad news. Anyway, as we watch this issue unfold, and similar problems around the world, 
It often seems like the decisions made by countries and leaders are uh, random and without any real purpose. However, if you'd like to be more logical in your decision making, then you should check out my favorite course on Brilliant. Their logical thinking course might start simple, but it builds, teaching you logical reasoning skills until you're solving problems which previously looked impossible. And you'll get used to that empowering feeling of learning, because Brilliant's not just about memorization and lectures. Brilliant teaches you by doing, using active learning techniques to teach you the principles behind otherwise complex subjects, and ensuring that you actually understand what's going on. Using this teaching methodology, you can learn about all kinds of STEM topics. That's algebra, applied probability, calculus, gravitational physics, and even cryptocurrency. In fact, they even have a new course from Kurzgesagt, which I have to say, I found very personally exciting and spent a lot of time playing with. Anyway, if you want to learn in a more fun way, then you should sign up to Brilliant. And the link in the description will get you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which is not only a great deal, but also supports the channel. So thank you.